Good morning, this is week seven, day three, 2024. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have spoken to us by your Son. The exact imprint of your nature, the radiance of your glory, who upholds all things by the word of his power. Just as much as things were created by your word, so they are upheld and sustained by your word. We praise you because this is one of those things that is beyond our ability to comprehend. We who can only take what is already here and fashion it into something else. Uh, the idea that your power is such that you can make something from nothing is cause for us to be amazed. And we are continually humbled as we consider what you have done for us and your desire uh, to dwell with us, to have a relationship with us, to call us your own. And we thank you and praise you on account of Christ. Amen. You reach the end of Exodus. You find the Spirit of God working through people who have some natural gifts of craftsmanship and the like, and yet working through them in a particular special way uh, to such a degree that everything is being completed just as the Lord commanded Moses. He's in there and he's setting everything up inside the tabernacle as it's going to be throughout all of their wanderings. He finished all of the work Verse 33, and the Lord responds. This climactic end of the book, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God has come to dwell with man. Yes, it's mediated. Yes, there's a sacrificial system. Yes, there are restrictions put in place and so forth. A reminder of the holiness of God versus the sinfulness of his people. That's just a, a wonderfully encouraging close to the book of Exodus. And I wanted to start there and then springboard to Hebrews chapter 1. We have this mentioning here, as I said a few weeks ago of the shift in biblical history, in the history of Revelation, where God spoke lots of different ways to the prophets, lots of different messages, and as far as the transition of those messages and how they were uh, conveyed to the people was different. You had people like uh, Ezekiel, who had a whole lot of signs and, and things that he did, these sign acts. Uh, you had a lot of text from somebody like Isaiah, where there's a lot of spoken word. You had periods with the word of the prophets not being heeded, and people kind of, you know, just refusing to listen to them. People not quite comprehending what God was trying to tell them through the prophets. It's sort of like what we hear in Isaiah that they may hear and yet not understand. But something changes here in Hebrews chapter 1. We are reminded that something has happened. We have this last days phrase that we see throughout the New Testament as a reference to the last period of history, that the shift has taken place surrounding the work of Christ through his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, bringing a, a fuller revelation than was ever given before, a climactic revelation. And that moment and that work of Christ ushered in the last days. 
And when we talk about this, we often use the phrase, already, not yet. That there is a sense in which there are certain things promised through the work of Christ on account of his completed work that we do experience in the present. And yet there are things that we know we are promised to receive and we haven't yet. And so we're in this sort of in-between period, these last days, where we experience some blessings in the here and now, but we're still waiting for other stuff to come in the future. One of those already bits you may think about is what happens in Acts chapter 2, in fulfillment of the prophet Joel, that one day the Spirit of God would descend on all peoples, regardless of whether they were a prophet or a skilled craftsman working on the tabernacle, or whether they were one of the judges. The Spirit of the Lord came upon in a special way to help uh, deliver the people of God from their oppression. But the Spirit of God would be pour out on, poured out on all people, regardless of their national standing, for instance, or their prominence in the community. And it would be an indwelling, consistent, constant, throughout the entirety of their lives as believers. That there's something that has changed, and that was a promise that Joel was looking forward to, to come in the latter days. And we see that has been fulfilled in Christ. And yet we also know there are other aspects of, uh, for instance, a perfect unity in Christ, where we're free from uh, divisions and sin that comes from that disunity and everything else that we don't have now. But we know we will one day receive, pictured there in Revelation chapter 7, as you have this multitude, uh, representative of all these different cultures on earth, all united, not divided and bickering and arguing, united around the throne of God. And the he author of Hebrews makes it a point throughout the whole book to show us how Jesus is better than anyone else. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the, the priesthood. His covenant is better. His sacrifice is better. And because of all of that, we are to have hope and encouragement and joy as we think about these things. And the opening here is about his uh, superiority to the angels. And so we have a lot of this language uh, to show that Jesus is fully divine, that he was not simply a great man. He is the radiance of the glory of God, that very same Glory of God that Moses talks about in the tabernacle. The exact imprint of his nature, as the creeds say, very God of very God, of the same substance as the Father, equal in power and glory. Hence, we have him talked about here, uh, doing the work of upholding the universe. Everything that God does is a triune act, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together, not all of them doing necessarily the exact same piece of the work, but in the context of considering the carrying out of these things, they work it together. And you might think about this from the perspective of salvation. The Father sends, the Son is the one who dies on our behalf, is raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit is the one who applies that to our lives. And so we have all three persons of the Trinity at work through these things. Then begins to talk about the name of God uh, being, the name of Jesus being greater than the angels, his throne being eternal. God never said that to an angel, but he says it to the Son. You have no end. It, you are the same. Your years never come to their completion. This is not something that God would ever say of when he's speaking to the angels. 
Or here, this reference, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The angels are God's agents. They carry out God's work. They praise God. They do great things. But none of them are the Son of God. None of them is a person of the Trinity. And I'll uh, kind of leave you with this thought. Verse 14 reads, Are they not, they being the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? We talked a few weeks ago about the idea that God is at work even when we're not aware of what he is doing. And that verse builds upon this idea as well. They are doing things that we're not even aware of, ministering to the people of God in ways many of us probably aren't even able to recognize, to see. Because we, again, we are talking about the unseen realm. Passages like this, I think, cause us to rightly uh, respond in doxology, in praise and, and thanksgiving of uh, a recognition of the depth of the work that God has done on our behalf. What it really means that, you know, you, you see so much political upheaval and turmoil and everything else, to know that one day Christ will set up his kingdom on earth and all of that, you know, default bickering and division and politicking that we see going on in the world and warfare and strife, which seems to be the, just the natural way things work because of sin, well, that will completely be gone. And it will be peace in the absence of strife. And, and nobody will have to be working hard to try and keep that peace because sin will just be removed. And peace will become the natural thing for us to do. To dwell on these things and to reflect on the promises of God, I think, is also a worthwhile response to his word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you would continue to transform our hearts and our minds, that we would indeed give you praise and thanksgiving as we reflect on the depth of your love and your grace and your mercies toward us in Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.